On the Monday following Palm Sunday, about the year 1430, the miners began to break ground for the foundations of Boston Steeple. By midsummer day, they had dug five feet deeper than the bed of the haven. When these words were written, four architects and countless workers, all now unknown to us, had completed one of the wonders of English architecture. A 270-foot tower worthy of the parish church of St. Botolph's Town, or Boston. Today, to thousands of tourists from all over the world, and to the people of this Lincolnshire town, it's the stop. But though that tower no longer fills the role of lighthouse for ships passing nearby in the North Sea, the church still serves the modern seaport and market centre. And it's here that choirs and congregations from Boston churches of all shapes and sizes unite for songs of praise, beginning with their opening hymn, All My Hope on God is Founded. Conducting the United Church Choirs of Boston, David Wright, choirmaster of the stump, stands in the 17th century pulpit, first used by the Puritan John Cotton, who fled from being vicar here to Boston, Massachusetts, and became one of the founding fathers of Congregationalism. In his day, at communion services, people crowded into the chancel, today dominated by the visible expression of a communion hymn, Lord enthroned in heavenly splendor.
Ivan Walden has an important job to do in the running of the Boston market. This must be a very old market, is it? Well, it's older than the stump, the church, as we, we call it the stump, you say. But... Seems to be an enormous market. How many stalls are there? Well, there's about 150 stalls here. But 150 here? And, yeah. and what do you have to do with this? Well, uh, I help to erect the stalls. And All make, 150 of them? Uh, part of them. We do it twice a week, yes. and it's about three hours in the morning and three hours at night. So what sort of hours are that? Well, it's uh, any time after midnight, you see. Uh, this is how it's planned. We plan it that way. We get them up, there's no traffic, and uh, everything goes along easy, you see. Mm. So what time did you get to bed this morning? Well, I got to bed about uh, half past three. <laughs> You're looking very well. Well, right. try, well keep, try to keep fit, you know. Yeah. Boston seems to be a very friendly town. We are a friendly lot in Boston. Yeah? Yeah. Well, <laughs> well everyone tells you they are anyway. Uh, what hymn have you chosen? The Old Rugged Cross. And why that? Well, it was uh, a favourite of uh, a bl uh, one of the chaps called Poggy. Poggy? Yeah, yeah. Well, this is his nickname, you see. Uh -huh. And uh, I went to his funeral and I heard it played there. He said he once did me a kindness. And I'd like to... Uh, have it played for the old retired people of the Boston Corporation who I work for as well, if that's all right. After a lifetime in nursing all over the world, Miss Lois Bueller and Miss Barbara Briley have retired to Boston. Miss Bueller is something of an historian. Boston as a port is very ancient, you know. It was very important in medieval times. The only port that is said to have been more important was London. And Boston then, you see, it was very handy for going to the continent. You can walk all the way from the Boston docks to where the river with them joins the wash and the Welland comes in as well. And it's only five miles from the centre of town, so anybody can walk both ways at one go if they want to. I like very much this open Fenland country. A lot of people don't like it very much, but I love to see the sky coming right down to the ground and the clouds bouncing out of the fields. It gives you feeling of open freedom and everything like that, which is just what I love. This monument is the one that was put up in memory of the Pilgrim Fathers, and that has rather made Boston famous, because Boston in Massachusetts is, of course, called after this Boston here. 
Well, why were the Pilgrim Fathers going to America anyway? Well, to get religious freedom, because, you know, they weren't allowed to worship the way they wanted it now. It just seems quite incredible because anybody worships what way they like, don't they? We chose and blessed are the pure in heart for various reasons. First of all, I think we've always admired the author, John Keeble, and then the words. There's only four verses, and yet it tells us the incarnation and the kingship of Christ. And then the last verse you can use as a prayer for yourself, if you like. It's a very simple verse. And the tune is nice for people like me who can't sing at all. Methodist Mike Jessup helps run the family business, selling china and glass. This is a family business. We started in 1876 with my great-grandfather. I'm the fourth generation with my father at the moment. Uh, we started off, or rather he started off as a sheet metal worker. Just as I followed my father into the business, I suppose I followed my parents into the church and went for some time out of habit. But then we started the Pilgrims, and after some time, I encountered Christ and be, became a Christian, and then it made a great difference to me. I enjoy Pilgrims because of the fellowship, the friends we meet, being able to be active in Christian worship. So often you can go along to a, a service on Sunday, maybe anywhere and just join in with the hymns and do very little else whereas pilgrims i think we give equal opportunity to all of them to join in where they can and where they want to and to arrange their own particular evenings thanks very much uh, stuart's going to read from the bible here a passage from romans do not think of yourself more highly than you should Instead, be modest in your thinking. Uh, well, the hymn I've chosen for this evening is We Are One in the Spirit. I think this says a lot, particularly when we're all meeting together at the stump. We are many, we are only one body in union with Christ.
bass Peter Fox and tenor Peter Fox. Both share not only a name, but the duties of singing regularly in the stump choir. Are you two related? No, not at all. No. Uh, we sing in the same choir, of course, but uh, there's no family connection whatsoever. That church really is magnificent, isn't it? It's, it's more like a cathedral. Oh, it's a beautiful place, yeah. Lovely residence when you're singing. How much does this mean you're involved in the worship? You're very limited. Uh, when you sing, you've got to concentrate on the music, the words, keeping things together. And uh, we probably shouldn't, don't get the same thing out of, out of the service as we should. Um, people in the congregation probably get far more out of it than we do. Uh, well, I suppose we have to concentrate more on the actual performance. Yeah, quite. Whereas the congregation can actually take part in more, perhaps, in the spiritual side of the yeah. service. Whereas we have to concentrate on the music. Perhaps, from yeah. our point of view, that's a, um, a minus quantity. We, yeah. we have to concentrate so much the service doesn't perhaps mean so much. In fact, some members of the choir like to come to a service which is not <coughs> choral yeah. in order to, yeah. uh, to stoke up their spiritual side, yeah, if you that's quite like. Sure. Now what hymn would you like to sing? We'd like to sing Jesus, the very thought of thee uh, to a tune by a, an old organist. He was here slightly before I joined the choir, uh, some nearly 50 years ago, Gordon Slater. We don't sing a lot of his music at, at, uh, in the stump, but uh, one or two things that he has dedicated to the church, and of course this is one of them with the tune St. Bottle. Lecturer Mike Haynes is a server. He's also scout leader of the St. Botolph troop. Right, Troop Sanderties then. I've been in scouting ever since I was eight when I joined as a cub. Uh, my father was a scout and so we've always had this family interest. The 5th Boston St. Botolph troop in fact, are an open troop. Um, although we have strong attachments to the stump, we in fact take lads of all different religions and we therefore have lads who are Jews and Jehovah's Witnesses and that sort of thing. Scouts don't have to necessarily be Christians because every scout makes a promise to do his duty to God, but of course in some countries their duty to God is expressed in a different sort of way as according to the religions in that particular country. The whole business of scouting is to provide an opportunity for a lad to develop himself physically in the outdoor activities, 
um, mentally in the type of work that he, we do insofar that they've got to be leaders, some of them. Um, they've got to show the other lads how to do it. And also spiritually insofar that we try and make a scout to become a complete citizen, in other words. Um, someone who can grow up to be more self-sufficient and who can render good service to others. Take that one out now then. Put it on there. Put it on this, on this plate, that's it. Every year we have a festival of scouting in the stump when we go along as a troop and in this we like to sing hymns which the lads enjoy singing and one of these is the battle hymn of the republic mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the lord and this i'm sure they'd like to sing on songs of praise Mrs. Carmela Riddle, a Roman Catholic, has encouraged Boston to make a rather unusual pledge. Can you tell me what it is? Yes, um, we have decided to adopt Jashatra uh, in the Tangai district of Bangladesh and we're going to help them and we're going to keep on helping them until they've built up a new life. Um, when we took over the project, they told us that if this project could get going, thousands of people would be saved from starvation, and we intend to keep on helping them until they are self-sufficient, we hope, anyway. How does Boston help in this project? We started by asking our bank manager if he would take care of us and the money and send it out. Um, and then, of course, we involved the churches, uh, and we have involved all the schools, the tiny little children do all sorts of things like sponsored jobs and sponsored fishes, fishing and various things. The secondary schools all help us. Um, we've got business people involved, we've got a farmer on the committee, um, ordinary people, we've got uh, retired business, uh, business people and professional people. You've got an enormous problem and you're breaking it down into little bits. 
and everybody's taking a little bit and people are becoming involved. You're sweeping away all the barriers and the people in the two communities are getting to know each other. And if they do get to know each other, you've no further problems because they're your people. You're friends with them and they're friends with you. They write to us. Um, they wrote to us last summer during the drought and they said, we're so worried about you. We wish that we could help you because you've helped us so much. Uh, and they say, we're longing for the day when we can send things to you. And when are you coming out to see us? How did you personally get involved in this? Well, I'd always um, been interested in the third world. And I'd always said that when my children were older, I'd give more time to it. And um, when all these tragedies happened in Bangladesh, I felt, well, if you mean what you say, it must be now. And you have to live with yourself. <laughs> if, uh, if I hadn't done anything at that time, I uh, really felt that I couldn't live with myself. <laughs> Just about a hundred years before this church was built, the two people we now know as St. Francis and St. Clare lived in Italy as plain Francis and Clare. Both come from rich families. They seem to have everything they want except... What must I do with my life? It's all wasted away. Wealth, wine, everything I want. And yet, I don't have what I really need. What must you do with your life? Just carry on. Enjoy your wealth, wine, expensive clothes. What more could any young man want or need? What must I do with my life? Must I spend it at ease as my family do? With all that food and idle, silly chatter. What must you do with your life? Do the things your family do. Eat all that food and take life easily. Waste your time and energy. Who cares? Away with you. That's all too easy. We know that there must be better things to do. Do goodness. They're all the same. Who are these people with candles and cross? Are they searching for something to do? That's the cross of Jesus. The candles must be his light, shining in the darkness of the world. Let's follow them.
Jesus, whose cross and resurrection we praise, and in whose loving arms we are held, inspire you to follow him with joy and melody in your hearts. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you tonight and evermore. Amen.